Excellent. And that brings us into our next exciting session, Women in Technology. Uh, it's a very important discussion on lessons learned from the front line during uh, COVID-19 and how low code has helped uh, shape the business landscape. Uh, this discussion is going to be led by our very own Catherine Costareva, CEO and managing partner of Creatio. And today, Catherine will be joined by some exciting guests, Lori Seal, CEO of Blytheco, Rebecca Wedeman, CEO and principal analyst at Valor, and Aina Neva Fiati, managing director at iSystems Asia. So Catherine, I'll turn it over to you. The floor is yours. Hello, hello. Hello, everyone. Excited to be here today. And I am thrilled to welcome my guests. Uh, we have Lori from Blysco, we have Rebecca, and we have Aina. Guys, thank you very much for joining us. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I can kick us off. I'm Lori Steele. I'm the CEO of Blythe Co. Um, I have been in the technology space for 20 years in roles spanning finance, operations, strategy, and M&A. I had the pleasure of growing my career at Sage, a large software publisher, where I served in various leadership roles for 13 years. I have been leading Blythe Co., a partner for Creatio, for almost nine years and I'm now co-owner of our firm. You know, growing up as a, you know, a young adult trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I really had no idea. And, you know, unfortunately I fell into the tech space, which I have absolutely loved serving in. You know, my background um, involved having an accounting degree and really I joined Sage as a staff accountant in my twenties. Yeah, and yes, so it wasn't I, intentional. I, 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 I didn't know that. That is fantastic. I, I knew that you had finance degree, but I never knew that you joined a, a, the company as an accountant. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And so it could have been anywhere. <laughs> kudos, Lori. And you grew to the CEO role of the company. It's been quite, it's been quite a, a fascinating journey. I think about, you know, maybe about a third of the way through, you know, I became so passionate about the operations and the marketplace. You know, I remember taking that leap going, am I going to leave finance and move into operation roles and then strategy roles? Um, you know, I think that's sometimes the courage to leave behind what right. we thought our plan was and right. embrace a bigger plan. So looking backwards, it all makes perfect sense, but I never would have saw how I would have landed where I am today. Love it. Love it. Lori. And Lori is joining us from California. So it's 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 7, 7.30 a.m. in California right now. Early morning. Is it Early correct? morning. I am hearing kids stirring upstairs, so it is indeed, indeed early. I'm first one up. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And at the same time, ladies and gentlemen, we have Aina, um, a founder and CEO uh, of our partner iSystem Asia, joining us from Indonesia, where it is 9.30 p.m. in the morning. Right? <laughs> so the yeah. kids are probably going to bed right now. <laughs> Aina, hello. Tell us, please introduce yourself and, and tell us how are things in Indonesia. Yeah, hi everyone. Nice to meet you all and very glad to be here. I'm about to sleep actually. It's about 10 p.m. here in Jakarta. <laughs> okay, uh, but thanks to Creatio for making this session happen. Okay, maybe firstly, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Aina Neva from iSystem Asia, a company based in Jakarta. So uh, I lead this company since 2012. Uh, the company is uh, focusing on the CRM and the business process automation. And we are also the certified partner of, uh, uh, of Creatio for Asia Pacific region. So actually, uh, I've been in the industry since 95. Oh, how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> but, your degree, Aina, but your degree is also... Like it's in marketing, right? You started in politics and then marketing. Tell us this story. How you got from marketing? How did you get into the tech industry? Yeah, actually, I graduated from marketing management. So uh, beginning my career, I started my career as a telemarketer. You know, the very uh, start, starting point as a telemarketer in an U.S.-based courier service company for about two years. After that, I started my IT journey working uh, in an IT company. It is the company reseller of an ERP application from US. Uh, 
So I was there for about four years in that company. Uh, with and then uh, I resigned with my last position as a head of uh, marketing and sales. Since then, uh, I continue my track, uh, my journey in IT business, and working from one IT com company to another company, mostly working with uh, leading world-class software vendors. Yeah. And yeah, that's the story. My career then, keeps going. In, 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 right, <laughs> right. And then in 2012, you founded iSystem Asia, right? I, I, so you were one of the founders. Uh, yeah, yeah. There are two founders, me and my late uh, uh, shareholder, but uh, passed away already five years back. So now I am alone here and the only uh, woman executive in the company. Got it. So we have a lot to discuss here with you. And 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 I have another founder here um, joining us today, Rebecca. Please tell us about Polar. Tell us about your story, how you got into tech, and and how you founded your company. Hey, Catherine. Thank you, and thanks everyone for joining today. Excited to to be here. So uh, yes, founder of, of Valwar, an analyst firm focused on maximizing the value, as the name would imply for those francophones out there, uh, of the relationships between people and technology. So focused primarily on customer relationship management and human capital uh, management and helping companies understand the value of the technologies in that space. Uh, before Valwar, I was a co-founder at Nucleus Research. Uh, before that, I uh, built and ran a European practice for IDC. So I've been an analyst for a long time, but I really got into tech um, uh, like a lot of people who fell into tech with an undergraduate degree in political science and French. It certainly wasn't uh, where I thought I was going, but my first job was in research for uh, the US government and uh, they needed someone to talk to the engineers about Voice of America, the radio program at the time. And so they sent the low woman on the totem pole to work with the engineers uh, and liaise with the research department. And I found that I had a knack for understanding, asking the right questions and being able to explain to non-technical folks what the geeks were saying. So that led me uh, to like that role of translation and technology. I went on to work for the International Telecommunication Union in Geneva, working on another technology transformation project. Uh, did my master's degree at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy with a focus on tech policy, uh, and then really built my career as an analyst and have been following the CRM space for uh, the better part of two decades now, um, and certainly following Creatio and the low code space for a long time as well. We are very lucky to have three of you at this panel today. That's, that's obvious. And I have a ton of questions to ask. And let me start, <laughs> and let me start with some stats. Uh, I have good news and bad news to share. So let's start with the good news. 47% of the employed population in the US today is women, which is great news, 47%. But at the same time, if we look at the tech industry, it's going to be 25%. And if we look specifically at the CIO role, it's going to be 18%, even less. So let's talk about this, the, 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 the uniqueness of the tech industry and why the percentage of the employed women in this industry is, is so much lower than in any other industry, like almost any other industry. Any thoughts on that? Hmm. I, I could I could certainly jump in. You know, I, th I think there there's certain things that we think about when we talk in advancement, and I know Lori has specific thoughts on that. But we have to we recognize that technology, engineering, STEM, not just entrant but entrance but advancement as well has been a pretty closed club for a long time, and particularly as women are working up the ladder, uh, networking is such a huge part of this. So certainly the ability to not just get entrance into programs, but to be accepted into the social groups around those programs, and then accepted into those networks at higher level of management is really important. I think too, we have to point out that um, women historically haven't asked as much as men have. And particularly in tech, where you may not have people looking for uh, people to ask for advancement, um, it, it becomes an important part of it. So I think, 
one of the things when I, when I talk with young women today is about asking for what, what you want and not being afraid to ask for that next opportunity. Right, right. And, and, and you know what, um, just before our panel, uh, Lindsay Scott, a former model, was uh, talking to uh, Andy um, about, about her current job, which is being a software developer with the previous career in modeling and theater. And uh, she mentioned that she literally was one in a whole group of people being a woman, but at the same time, a woman of color. So, so like, uh, she, like her feedback uh, to Andy was that 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 she's she's more or less often feels herself alone among women, uh, among men in tech in in software development industry. And do you guys believe that low code, no code technology is gonna be changing this trend that we're seeing in the tech industry, where only twenty five percent of women? Um, uh, are um, employed um, by the tech companies. Like, do you believe that low code, no code would be would be the solution here? Rory, Rebecca, Aina, what do you think, guys? You know, I think when you go ahead, Rebecca. No, please. You know, it's interesting to me all these wonderful programs that are out now, right? Like Girls Who Code, right? Um, wonderful programs that are, I think, setting the right role model for women to embrace, you know, their, you know, kind of coding super skills. You know, when you do think about more of a, a low code, no code environment, I think it also plays into other skills that women can bring, empathetic listening, right? You know, being able to configure and tailor solutions to help companies really get the most out of their software investment. You know, it's not just about being in a back room and programming anymore. Yeah. It's around tailoring software to help companies get jobs done. And a lot of that is change management. A lot of that is, you know, visioning, you know, elegant solutions. There's design elements, you know, functional design. And those skills in my mind are more critical to helping companies leverage technology than just hardcore coding. So I think in many ways, I think it's going to unlock a broader spectrum of capabilities, particularly ones that women can bring to the table. Oh, Laurie, that's a brilliant point. Um, let me rephrase it. Are you saying right now that the skills that you need to be a successful citizen developer rather than a coder and, and professional developer, professional software developer, are, are very, very different and they fit women much more than they fit men? Is it is it the message, actually? You know, I mean, I, I don't want to be, you know, um you know, limiting any gender, you know, I think we're all, I have a lot of masculine capabilities that I know a lot of men that have very nurturing capabilities. But I do think in terms of the stereotypes that we think, you know, that maybe have prevented certain people from being interested in certain professions, I think it's absolutely going to level set and make more accessible putting technology to work for sure. Absolutely. I'm with you. Just to add on, just to add on what Lori said, Catherine, you know, we, um, Low code has been around for a long time. Yeah. Right. What is different about right now? Well, what's different about right now is the community around low code, the ability to get online and learn how to use it, to ask questions of other people who know how to use it, but also to contribute my expertise, right? To grow my career, see opportunities for me to not just learn more, but earn more. Um, as a low code developer, and to be able to do all of that online in the distributed community. You know, there's the old saying on the internet, no one knows you're a dog, right? Yeah. In the low code world, no one cares where you are, who you are. They care about your expertise, your knowledge, and your willingness to contribute and help others in that low code community. And that's where people are building, building the reputation building their ability to earn, building their profiles as leaders today is in that virtual community that now exists in the low code world. And that's super important for leveling the playing field and giving a lot of opportunities for both entering and advancing in the workforce. Yeah, and I, Catherine, I think, I think with the rise of low code technology in my opinion, in my point of view, I believe that more and more women and citizen developer will take the role as the developers. I believe that 
the the easy to use of the low code platform is enable them to do that and and where uh, traditional programming are we know majority mm -hmm. mastered by men rather than women uh, maybe also because of the nature of the woman i think designing is more interesting for women rather than doing the hard coding right that that might be true and and and, and um I, i'm with you here but um I'd love to hear your thought about another survey that that uh, the results of the survey said that 78% of women in tech feel that they have to prove their worth more than their their um, uh, men peers. Uh, have you have you experienced that? And do you believe that low code no code approach and technology will be helping? With this challenge as well, like proving that you you are actually a professional and and you're worth attention uh, from the um, uh, from the colleagues. What are your thoughts on that? Could like um, to start, Lori. Yeah, you know, I, I um, I think this goes back to, you know, I, I, you know, when you go back to how kids were raised, you know, generations before. You know, men were out there sword fighting and women were, you know, playing house. And, you know, I think there's there's a difference in how kids are being raised today. I mean, my daughter's a gamer. She's got a headset. She's playing with the boys. She's right there, you know, getting into the fray with them. You know, so so we're in a sense, you know, we're the generations that are evolving how we see ourselves. And that's shaping how we're raising our children to see ourselves. So to me, you know, I don't think it's as much our hard wiring as it, it I think it's our software, not our hardware. Um, and that we're, you know, in a sense, reprogramming what our, our capabilities are. We're shattering our own glass ceilings. We're making that clear. I mean, my, my daughter's 13 years old and she grows up in a house where her mom's the CEO of a software company. No one's going to tell her that she can't lead or be in tech or do, you know, any of the things that she wants to do. So I, I do see it more as, you know, some of the, um, the roles that, you know, were, were probably critical, you know, in, in, a, in a former time where, you know, someone went out and, you know, provided and someone did the really hard job of, you know, hearth and home and raising the kids. And, you know, many days I think, oh, you know, I get to go to work, like raising these teenagers, you know, that's, that's the hard stuff, you know. It is actually, I would agree with you. I'm joking with my husband all the time that being the CEO of the company is so much easier than raising a teenager who I have in the house as well. Yes, I can't I know what you support. ladies think, but yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what you ladies think, but that's, you know, my take on, you know, a lot of these stats is just, you know, we're going through kind of a societal transformation. Yeah, so, so you're seeing actually, you're saying actually that our kids uh, won't be like we we won't see the stats of, of of female feeling that they need to prove themselves and work harder in order to prove that they are uh, as as brilliant as as their uh, male co-workers. That's that's actually that's my view. Mm. Okay. I know. Um, how are yeah. things in Indonesia? <laughs> Tell me about Indonesia. How are things there uh, in in terms okay. of? Yeah, yeah. If if I remember my 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 uh, my previous experiences, I don't think that happened to me, Catherine. Mm -hmm. uh, my male coworkers were very supportive and cooperative, so we work hand in hand to achieve our goals uh, together. And even in my personal experiences, that those many times happen in opposite, where my male coworkers have to work harder than me. And they have to prove that they are capable on their position. That's that's my experience. I don't know where in US maybe that's happened here uh, with me in Jakarta. <laughs> I'm sure that, that we're gonna see a lot of people uh, thinking about moving to Indonesia after after what you just said, Aina. <laughs> that's brilliant. Thank you, Rebecca. What have you seen and experienced? You know, I think what Lori said is so important about this cultural shift that we're seeing. And I think that uh, certainly I've experienced it, but as we see a new echelon of managers come in to organizations that have 
had their software upgraded, as Lori said, and are looking at opportunities um, across the board. I think we're also raising um, and empowering young women who aren't afraid to ask and who have more confidence, whether they're gamers or coders or part of Girls Who Code, we're starting earlier on those things. So I think it takes, yes, the, the cultural shift that, that Lori mentioned in, in raising children, but also upgrading our, our management and our leaders who have a broader view of, of what everyone can bring to the table today. By the way, talking about um, management and leaders, let's look at some stats again. So if you look at the support staff, we're going to see 47% of women working in different roles. When we look at the manager's roles, we're going to see already 37% there. Senior management, 29%. Executives, 23%. Board members, ladies, 17%. So it, it looks like a leaky pipeline to me, right? Because uh, the numbers are decreasing the higher in this ladder you're, gro you're going. And, and, and again, it's, it's a lot of about this balancing act between be your, your responsibilities at home and all the pressure you have be, being the female in, in like old stereotypes about the role of female in the family, but at the same time, having very, very high responsibilities being the CEO of your companies. Share your experience. I'm sure that we, we have a lot of um, female um, listeners here at, at our audience asking questions and participating in this discussion. What is your best practice? How to balance uh, this, this um, workload that you have uh, as um, female leaders of your companies and at the same time, all the responsibilities you have at home? And in general, what do you think about this leaky pipe? Um, the higher you go, the smaller the percentage of women. I think it's a latency thing. You know, my view is you fast forward 20 years and I think we're going to see much greater um, equity in those numbers, you know, I, I, it's just kind of going back to, you know, when I was coming up the ranks, you know, there were still, um, you know, I think about like my whole background and how many women did I report to? And I literally had one female executive in my entire career that I reported to. Other than that, I reported to men, but I think that's more of a function of, you know, again, just those changing roles over the last 50 years. You know, less women were, you know, really striving, you know, they were the ones that would take extended time and step back out of their career to raise the kids and come back in. So there was this sort of lost momentum. And as I look in my business today, we have over, you know, 100 employees, we're a virtual organization, we're in 26 states. So, you know, we've got a really interesting representation of diversity in our business, you know, ages, skills, you name it. And we're about 50-50 in both our leadership team of men and women, which is not common for tech, and in our entire workforce, we're 50-50. So, you know, we're seeing it. And I think, you know, as I look towards the future, you know, I've had, you know, recently, you know, female team members who had a baby, you know, so sometimes it's the men that are taking paternity leave now. I'm right. seeing different choices become available and different ways that younger, professionals are partnering to raise the children that, you know, are starting to look different. So I'm wondering, you know, Catherine, if, you know, we, we just allow that sort of change to continue to play out, you know, are we going to find that there's a lot of female board leaders, you know, 30 years from now, because I'm just not seeing that same mindset earlier in the workforce that many of us inherited and had to redefine. Right, right. So, so, you know, Lori, uh, are you saying that it lies close? If we take the whole executive team, how many, do you mind if I ask, how many people do you have on the executive team? Well, I don't know if I would carve it out just on our executive team, but if I say our management, team, management. all of our yeah. people managers, yeah, management. We about 20, we have about 20 folks that are people managers and about 10 of those are women. Are women. Okay. So you are actually at this 50-50 uh, target that everyone is, is dreaming about. Here at Creature, I can share with you, we're at 40% of women population um to 60 percent of men but fantastic kudos on that that's 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 amazing news actually congratulations that's awesome 
Aina, Rebecca, what do you think? It, it, and, and share with us either your numbers or just share your thoughts about this, this um, yeah, career ladder that, that, that is leaking on, on its way. You know, I would, I would say a couple of quick things. First of Valoir is small. We, we're, we're eight people, um, but uh, majority women uh, by far. Um, wow. That's wow. A, a function of finding the right people and nurturing the right people, I think. I think we have to separate the board question from the rest of the management question because board is very much invitation only. And so I think we'll see that happen slower. We've certainly seen efforts to bring more women onto board position, but um, I'm on a board today. I'm the only woman um, and board is very much still a networking um, connection based uh, recruiting system at that level. But I wanted to build on one thing that Lori said about changing how we think about the workforce, because I think we have a real opportunity right now. Obviously, the whole work from home phenomenon has hit women harder than it has men in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. But as we think about reopening and redefining what our work roles look like, women mm -hmm. also have an opportunity to ask for more, to demand more in that new remote or hybrid work environment for what works for them, whether it's uh, different hours, different days, uh, different locations for work. Um, now is an opportunity for as we move out of the tactical, we have to figure out remote work to the long term, how do we maximize a hybrid work environment for women to look at not just tech support, but their entire career support and say, I can define my role more actively in my way that works for me to balance that. I think that's super important to think about right now. It's very, very, very important um, things to think about. And uh, actually, Rebecca Lurie, again, kudos to you, uh, to your numbers, because I'm looking at the poll results right now. And we asked the audience who, who joined the session, uh, what are the percentage of women in the executive team at your companies? So guess what, what the results are, uh, because, because the results are very, very sad, honestly. 36% uh, believe that uh, less than 15% of their executives in their companies, and those could be huge, large organizations, of course, are women, less than 15%. 27% of respondents say that it, it is 45% plus and 18% between 15 and 25. So it's still a lot of work to do for many companies to get more women into the executive teams, into the senior management. But uh, Rebecca, I'm with you. I, I do completely agree that like when you deliver, when, when, you, when, when, when you work as a professional and deliver the results, it's, it's so much easier to grow um, in this career ladder from, from the professional to the senior management level to the executive leader level to the CEO of the company. But the board thing is, is, is pretty different. So it will take a little bit longer to get there in terms of the numbers in agreement here. Um, Aina, what, what do you think uh, on, on this um, uh, leaky pipeline uh, of the career ladder? Yeah. Here uh, in my company, uh, we have only 10% of women uh, uh, and 10% and, uh, total, uh, total uh, from the population. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the executive level, only myself uh, as, the, as a woman. So yeah. why why, why uh, do you believe like is uh, why the situation is so different? For example, if we, we take uh, Blyska, you both are our system integrators. I know that both of your companies are fantastic and doing great. Like why, Lori? Uh, I know why do you think there is such a big difference in terms of women population in your companies? Uh, and although again, both companies are super successful. Yeah, yeah, a yeah. lot of its brand. You know, when you're really promoting um, a brand that's warm, you know, I think too, you know, having women in leadership, I know we had a lot of, um, you know, it's a very competitive hiring market we're all in. I mean, getting tech talent is the hardest thing that we all do, right? Getting quality, you know, team members to implement and deliver our solution. And we've actually had a number of, of, of you know, earlier in their career women 
who one of the reasons for joining Blythe is they like the fact that there's a female CEO. I mean, it's kind of a, maybe a, a weird, you know, reason to join a company, but they feel their journey will be very well supported. So is there sort of maybe a laws of attraction thing happening? I mean, Catherine, you mentioned similar stats for today's show. You know, I think that, you know, women, you know, co- you know, the, the girls who code and they look at that and they think, oh, I want to work there. You know, it's, it, there's a testament to you being the founder and the, the CEO, you know, that I think is inspiring for other women. I think they're attracted to join those kinds of companies. So maybe there's, you know, some selection bias, you know, in that you know, a little bit, but I'd certainly be interested in the other ladies and, you know, their perspective. Aina, what yeah. do you think? Yeah, I think um, maybe because of most of the, uh, most of our team is uh, programmers and engineers. So mm-hmm. most of them are men. So uh, the non-tech, uh, naturally, uh, women uh, work in non-technical profession so the woman in our company mostly uh, work for uh, non-technical profession like uh, marketing communication secretary yeah. things like that mm-hmm. so Aina, are you are you telling right now that in indonesia maybe the um, the education uh, and the uh, colleges and universities are not have so many graduates in, in computer science and not so many people working in computer science so you actually even, even you, although I'm sure you'd love to have more women um, developing uh, the software and doing technical job, you literally can't find them in the country. Is it, is it kind of a challenge we're talking about here? Um, I, I, I think it goes back to the nature of the woman here. Uh, so uh, most of the computer science graduates are men. So uh, it is, it is, uh, it is. Uh, Hard for us to find a uh, woman programmers mm-hmm. uh, for our company, even though I, I think it's better if we combine between the men and women programmers to make it company more uh, balanced. But yeah, thanks to local technology, maybe after this, then we can have more more women involving as a citizen developers. And, 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 and do you guys see um, a lot of additional challenges that women have uh, in the tech world, or even even not only the tech world, but even if we talk about uh, the senior management and leadership jobs in the companies, do you believe that these days, and again, I, I, I completely agree that in the future, the situation, like in 10 years even from today, the situation is going to change. But if we take nowadays, do you believe, do you see that it's more challenging for women to take these executive roles in the companies and to run all the responsibilities uh, that that uh, these executive roles require in comparison to the men? Do, do you see do you see any additional challenges or do you believe it's it's quite kind of equal today? Uh, yeah, I, I can say that, yeah, for women, it's uh, harder for them to get a uh, higher ladder in the management position. Uh, maybe because of the natural patient of women or their uh, motherhood uh, t- type of uh, person's love, something like that. So uh, I see that still men are dominated uh, dominate the leadership uh, ladder yeah uh rebecca Lori, what do you see uh, guys like let's talk a little bit i know that we have just a few minutes left but i really would love to hear from your side it's it's obvious that in indonesia there are there are more challenges for for women to take the leadership job what about the us today I think Lori's point about culture is so important. You know, I think a big part of it is culture and it depends on the individual company. And I think women entering, both entering the workforce and looking for a new career are increasingly looking at who is in the management leadership? What does that mean about culture? And what does that mean about the opportunities for advancement? So it certainly depends sector by sector and even company by company. I would say there certainly are organizations where there are still big challenges for women. There are others like Blythco that, that are doing a great job, obviously, uh, promoting uh, women and, and bringing their skills to the table. And I think that's great. You know, it's still so hard, right? I mean, I think part of what's hard is the expectations that we put on ourselves. You know, some days I feel like I'm, 
you know, uh, uh, failing as a mom and failing as a leader. It's so hard to balance. And, you know, those standards we put on ourselves, I still want to be present, you know, with my, my children. I want to be, you know, super intense, you know, working and just getting, you know, goals accomplished and super driven professionally and, you know, trying to like sometimes just accept that you're doing the best you can and cut yourself some slack. I mean, you know, it's, 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 we strive so hard. So many of us to break these, these glass ceilings and we get to these positions of leadership. And then there are some days I'm like, Whoa, why did I want to do this again? You know? <laughs> you know? So it's, it's a, it's a wonderful journey. And I think, you know, being a woman and expecting ourselves to also be nurturing and keeping our house awesome and, you know, keeping our social calendar up to date and being a great spouse, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves and, uh, you know, it's not an easy journey. You know, you know, Lori, I, I'm going to share with you guys this anecdote that I have from my personal life. Uh, uh, my, my two sons uh, asking me, uh, mom, why are you working so hard? Uh, our friends, moms, like we don't see them on, on over the play date, all this stuff. We don't see them working so hard. Why are you literally spending so much time doing work, like job, not, not the kind of home? <laughs> and I, I, I will be very honest with you. Sometimes I'm stuck how to answer this question because it, it depends on the situation. Every time my answers are different, but sometimes I'm completely stuck how to, to answer this one. Yeah, because, because again, I, I, and, and I'm with you. I, honestly, I, I have no doubt that in, in five, 10 years, the situation is going to change dramatically. And we're going to be, we're a blind case today. We're going to see 50, 50%. Uh, men, women at work in senior positions. So I'm confident it's going to change, but we're not there yet. So the only question is, we're not there yet. We're, we're getting there as a society, as, 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 as uh, human beings, we're getting there, but like it takes, it takes time, time and effort. So um, last question, and I see this comment here. I just love to read it uh, from a chat, and that would be my last one very quickly. Uh, my niece is learning how to code. She is five. Uh, and the question is, awesome. is yeah, this is awesome. I, I do like that's fascinating. Is equality has to do with where the companies are located. So again, I like we're blessed to have California, Virginia, and Indonesia uh, on this call today. So do you believe that the situation is very different in different parts of the world? And again, it's going to take a little bit longer for some, some other regions to get there. So that would be my last question for yes. today. What Absolutely. do you think? Okay. Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> 100%, yes. So Lauren, do you believe that California is there already? Like, is, is Blaiska with, with your 50-50% ratio unique? Or like on average in California, that's what you see, guys. I, I think it is unique. And again, we're in 26 states, so I can't really cite it as, you know, any particular geography, um, you know, at all. You know, I do think, though, it does vary quite a bit by, by country, you know, and by kind of the societal values and roles. And that, that's progressing at very different rates, you know, because this is very new you know, what we're doing, I mean, technology, you know, back in the days, you know, I mean, you know, men were like, you know, getting the big game and women were like tending the fields. I mean, we've evolved, like technology didn't exist a hundred years ago. So the whole like ways that we can produce an income are very new in the, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of years that we've been a, a human species. And it's just such a fascinating thing we're, we're seeing, but I would definitely agree it, it really is around more around societal and cultural norms, you know, in my opinion. Aina, thank you. Thank you, Lori. Aina, what do you think? Is the situation different in terms of geographies? Aina, Rebecca, your final thoughts on this one? Absolutely different in terms of geographies, different in terms of culture of the company, but we have to remember too that uh, the first coders were women, right? Oh. When computers came out, it was, it was the the secretary, the typer's job to do those coding. It wasn't until the men realized that the stuff was really valuable that it became a man's job. 
Right. So that's that's a great comment. And let me wrap up on this beautiful comment about the first female coders. And thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, Aina, Lori. Seriously, fantastic pleasure. Great conversation. Thank you very much for being with us. And I hope that's the great final day of the Low Code Marathon. Thank you again and have a wonderful day and evening, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.